Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program Associate here at the Forum on Workplace Incl Inclusion. I'm pleased to have you here today for Seizing the Moment to Create a New, More Inclusive Normal with presenters Maureen berkner Boyd of the Moxie Exchange, Stephanie Douglas of Bungle, and Becca Glen Glenberg of Upstart. This is the first webinar of our 2021 Forum on Workplace Inclusion webinar series. We thank you for being here. We hope you enjoy this experience and find this information helpful in your work and join us for future webinars. Today, Maureen, Stephanie, and Becca will be presenting for about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end. The chat feature will not be opened. Please utilize the Q&A feature to ask qu any questions. There will be polls throughout this webinar, so, we, so please feel free to participate in those. At the end of this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out this survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars. We truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is SHRM and HRCI eligible. The activity IDs will be provided at the end of the webinar. It is, this webinar is also being recorded and being broadcast live on, face, uh, live on Facebook. The recording will be posted onto our website within the next week along with the slides. Visit our website formworkplaceinclusion.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. Before I hand things over to Maureen, Stephanie, and Becca, I would like to share a brief message from our Executive Director, Steve Hummerkaus. As you may know, the forum is dedicated to providing the very best learning and development programming for diversity, equity, and inclusion education. During regular times, we provide webinars and podcasts on a variety of topics on a monthly basis throughout the year, as well as our flagship conference in the spring. During these virtual times, we are working even harder to present more programming for you, including some specific to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our workplaces, ourselves, and especially our underserved populations. We provide most of our resources, like this webinar, for free. We are able to do this thanks to generous support of our community. We know these web resources have great value to you, as since so many of you regularly participate in our, and we're grateful to have and to have so many virtual offerings are full beyond capacity. Like many other organizations, we are experiencing challenges during this pandemic. In order to sustain our work, we have added a donation button to our website and to each of our podcasts and webinar pages. We ask that you donate what you feel is the value of this service to help us continue to bring the very best DEI training to you and to help us fulfill our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, and igniting change. Every donation is fully tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Without further ado, I would like to hand things over to Maureen, Stephanie, and Becca. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. We are excited to kick off the series for this year. And before we jump into our content, I think we need to give a nod to the historic day that yesterday was for inclusion. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm wearing my pearls. And I've got my Chuck Taylors on as a nod to Kamala Harris, the first female, first black and first Asian American vice president. So nice inclusive way to start the year after um, what has been very, very difficult. Um, there has been a confluence of events as we all know, but I, I wanted to really ground us um, at the start of why Steph uh, and Becca and their organizations were able to make such progress this last year. It was because you know, we had COVID um, and we saw the impact of that on um, particularly people with disabilities, um, on working um, parents, in particular moms. There's some statistics coming out that one in four women are, are considering leaving the workforce because they just can't do it all. Um, our essential workers um, who were frontline, who didn't have the opportunity to work from home. <clears throat> Everything that happened um, with George Floyd's murder, um, the increased awareness on uh, racial injustice, um, a mental health crisis um, as a result, you know, we were already um, faced with a mental health crisis in this country and this has just exacerbated that. So really what we've seen um, since this time last year is this um, intersectionality of inequity laid bare. Um, you know, when you look at who is the, you know, the latest stats about who lost jobs um, was really 
um, women of color, in particular Latina and Latinx women of color. And then if you intersect that with um, class and um, essential workers and parental and caregiving status and disability, you know, we already know that folks with disabilities are both the highest unemployment and underemployed. Uh, so really we had a perfect storm. Um, a perfect storm of inequity, a perfect storm of um, what I have found is the, the first time that people with a lot of privilege willing to give up the privilege of comfort um, and willing to actually see some of the privilege that they have and understand that we don't want to go back to normal um, because normal was not working for most people, right? So let's, let's seize this moment to make a shift, um, seize this moment because you can really move people through a change cycle faster when literally everything is up in the air. Um, in this last year, everything was up in the air and um, seeing some progress on um, how to build back in a way that's far more equitable, far more inclusive. And so we're going to walk through and Really what I wanted to do um, with Steph and Becca is ask a lot of questions um, and sort of dig in because these two have done some extraordinary work. Uh, we partnered with them at, at Moxie and you know, seeing the things that they've done. So we'll have polls throughout. Um, I think Ben mentioned that, but really wanted to ground sort of, you know, where were they in their journey? Um, you know, what happened with work from home? How did they leverage that energy that everybody has felt around? What can I do? What can I do? You know, how did they engage their executive teams in a long-term strategy or build on the long-term strategy that they already had? And then different ways um, that they brought programming. So uh, throw your questions in chat. Um, I can see that, which is great. Not chat, in the Q&A. Um, we'll be watching for those. I actually want to start us with a first poll. Um, Ben, I think you're launching those, or I can. Okay, so have you experienced heightened awareness, desire to act and focus on DEI in your organization since this confluence of events, since this perfect storm? Um, yes, no, or, or my, my, we were already all in on this. Um, and have you seen a resource change? You know, is, are, have budgets suddenly opened up or are you hiring people or are you seeing more time being spent um, on initiatives? And we'll leave this up just for a little while. It's fun seeing results um, coming in overwhelmingly so far. Um, you're definitely experiencing heightened awareness. Um, you are seeing, it's about a three to one so far on um, the increase of uh, resources. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. You can see the results here. So lots of focus. Um, you know, it's, it is interesting. And we've seen this across the organizations that, that we work with. It's, um, and, and this actually gives me hope uh, because I'm seeing, certainly there was some, the focus from some organizations that was really performative. You know, we're going we're gonna to put this, you know, statement out or we're going to do this thing. But as I said, I, we've also seen more organizations than actually putting resources, time, people, budget, right? That's where the, the rubber meets the road um, around we're actually, you know, this matters. You know, you spend your money and your time and your resources on things that matter in your organization. So this is great to me, um, seeing that y'all are experiencing this as well. Um, so I'm going to actually have us now dig in with, um, with Steph and Becca. Um, if the two of you would share, so where were you? And we talk about this as a journey. Um, you're never there. There is no destination. Um, our work with companies, we really talk about um, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, really being like a healthy lifestyle. Right. It's, it is something, it's a set of things that you do day in, day out, the choices that you make. Um, and so, Steph, I'd love to hear from you. Um, where were you? 
You know, I think that we were in a place that I was pretty proud of. Um, always so much more work to do. We're, uh, we're a fairly small company, uh, about 280 people. And we have offices around the world, which is great. So that already starts to build in a comfort and understanding of the importance of diversity. Um, that gives you a great, a great foundation. And we had done the, the foundational work and, and I can't emphasize enough how important that foundation is. So it may not be the stuff that is super jazzy and exciting. Um, and certainly when we had this renewed, exciting energy, you're able to do some of those big, exciting things, uh, which is great, it, shif it shifts things quickly. But if you, you need to get to those basics, you need to start with those basics and make sure they're built in. And that's the stuff that I think um, we're most proud of. So we had a huge commitment to investing in immigration. And it's something that, um, you know, we put a lot of money and energy and time into. And in, in a 250 person company at the time, we had over 30 nationalities. So that's a great way to do it. We do unconscious bias training in all the onboarding, um, the talent acquisition process. That's the stuff where you can really build in an unbiased hiring practice. Um, and that will carry through the whole life cycle of, of employees. So you make sure that you have things like fair ways to evaluate where you can remove that bias so that's that popular people you know moving up the ranks or people who might be of a certain demographic because you're like we want people who are old and strong and you're like is that matter for an engineer um so really kind of doing the work in that foundation of removing bias being inclusive in a recruiting process. And then really importantly, once people arrive, building a, an onboarding that says, okay, well now you're here, let's make sure that you're experienced to stay here and be part of the organization's better. So that means if you want to get away from a certain demographic, you need to make sure that you've got educational process in place because people may not know about ad tech, which is what we work in. And if we want to broaden our pool, that means we need to, when we bring them on, have resources for them to onboard quickly. So some really, really good work uh, in the foundation, I'd say, is the most important thing. Yeah, I think there's, um, and I think one of the things that you talked about is not just the, we're going to do, um, you know, some of the performative, we're going to bring in a whole bunch of you know, diversity. And I don't know about y'all, but I see it's like this slow moving train wreck that I think is going to happen where there are all these companies that are waving a flag and saying, we're going to go and we're going to recruit at all the HBCUs and we're going to have X number of black employees by blah, blah, blah. And then they're going to put them in a toxic work environment um, where, right, they're not even thinking about the and so they're, they're working on the diversity, but they're not working on the equity, the inclusion and the belonging. And what I love Steph hearing you say is you've always right looked at hiring across the diversity spectrum and then how do they land in your organization and how can they thrive in your organization? And it's not perfect. You know, you still have, everyone's got bias in them. So it is really almost an unprogramming of what we think requirements would be for certain jobs. Um, that will lead you to a more, you know, a, a less inclusive workforce. So that stuff isn't, um, it isn't easy, but it's very, but it's doable. It's very doable. Yeah. We, we say sometimes things are simple, but not easy. Yeah, that's right. It is. It's simple, not easy. <laughs> Becca, you want to chime in here? Sure. Um, so I, I'll start was at a little bit of a, a different place when I joined, which was about a year ago. Um, just a few months before we transitioned to working from home, I think diversity has been a part of Upstart's origin story. Um, and, and that's for two reasons. One, you know, we're an AI lending platform with an, a mission of increasing access to credit. And so diversity is foundational to the customer uh, uh, that we, the customers that we are trying to serve um, because we are looking to um, uh, provide a service to people who have been historically um, underserved by traditional credit models. And so for that reason alone, diversity is just a, an incredibly important priority to the company. But in addition to that, we have three really diverse co-founders who represent diversity of um, age, race, gender, educational background, and you see the value of their diverse perspectives in the way the company has been built and the foundations that we have in our business model. The three of them can poke holes in 
every decision we make um, such that we have really fortified solutions when we're ready to get them launched. And so we have sort of had this organic value of diversity from the beginning. Um, it's something that we've known was important. And um, I think being a small company prior to when I joined, inclusion also was happening relatively organically. When I joined a year ago, we were just building out the people ops function. And one of the first priorities that one of the co-founders gave me is, Becca, we need a defined DNI program. You can't just rely on our history uh, in order to make sure that this builds and scales the way it has been in the past. Um, and that was so we were at the beginning of a programmatic DNI journey, you know, prior to prior to working from home. And that was when I found you, Mo, right? Because one of the first things I knew being a new people ops leader at the company was I was going to need to bring in support. I was going to need to bring in expertise um, because while I have um, a, I've had good exposure to strong diversity and inclusion programs, I still recognize there is still so much more to learn and so much more that we, we just need to leverage all the support we can get. Um, so we interviewed a lot of different um, consultants and looked at a lot of different platforms and ultimately landed on Moxie. And I think, um, so the thread, you know, for both of you is sort of built into the DNA and then doing the ongoing work and seeing this not as, not as a flash in the pan, um, really. I keep clicking through. So then, so you were on the journey, you were started, um, and then we were all thrown in to, to work from home, um, those that were able, right? And I think this is something that's, that's really important to, to layer in essential, non-essential, um, and how, you know, what that meant for um, class, for, you know, vulnerable populations, um, that, that this was a great experiment for a lot of employees and a lot of, of employees didn't even have the opportunity for this. Um, so there's always been this historic resistance and uh, my daughter is actually a person with a disability and she and she's a young working adult. And it was interesting hearing her, you know, when she watched all of this happen um, and she was that, you know, she looked at me and she said, mom, isn't it interesting? Um, things that people from the disability community have been asking for for years, but we were told it wasn't possible. Suddenly, um, you know, suddenly we can do these things. Um, so there was some real ableism that was also, um, you know, we, we saw that in, in great display. So boy, and it has been an experiment, hasn't it? There's been the good, the bad, the ugly of this. Um, how were you able to, to sort of crank through some of the resistance for folks that were able to do this, right? Um, both of you, you know, you've got different campuses, different folks. How'd you get, I mean, A, it was mandated by law, right? So, but then how'd you get people up to speed and what have been some of those negatives and positives? Yeah, I think that, you know, quite frankly, we're, those of us who work in, um, in technology, right? We have this this real benefit right now that our people are ready to work from home for the most part. People can work from home. Uh, we had, we actually didn't do work from home at this <laughs> company, but we did work with other offices all the time. So people were constantly already on Zoom calls or Hangouts. They were working in weird time zones. They were sometimes working from home, just not during work hours where they were working from work. Um, so this really pushed that uh, you know, it just did happen. We actually closed our offices in each region ahead of mandates because um, I'm a little obsessed with the pandemic. So <laughs> it was something that we, we actually did. I know, weird fact. Um, but I think that this was, you know, there are great things about it, right? It shows that you can do it. Um, and there are horrible things about it. I mean, I think it was very hard on our, our working parents. We actually have working moms. We have a lot of working dads too. Um, and this was... You know, I think that people think, oh, it's great because this shows that people can work from home. It's been really hard on our parents, um, really hard on our parents. And, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to support them, but this is not, not easy um, for any of them. I think the other thing that brought great awareness uh, to our teams that we, we work to bring great awareness to our teams is it's great that our teams could all go home. But there's a lot of people who depend on us being in the office for their livelihood. We have food delivered. Um, so there are restaurants, local restaurants that we've supported 
for years that now we're in jeopardy um, and, and all those small businesses around us. And, and it gave us an opportunity to say, we're not going to feed you at work anymore, but we are going to feed people who are food, food vulnerable in our neighborhoods from the restaurants that no longer serve us so that they can stay in business. And, and so there's been this great opportunity to highlight the great privilege that our teams have by giving back. Um, and so I think that that's something that you can do when you come into these kinds of situations is, is, is highlight what privilege actually looks like and then what do you do with that? And in this case, we did a number of things. One of them was, you know, donated 10,000 meals and kept some, some small businesses in, in, um, in business. So it, it's been a very interesting time for people. Yeah, and I think that it, it has been, um, I, I was listening and I, I'll have to see if I can find it and I'll, I'll send it out to folks. Um, single black mom of four kids um, in the Bronx in lockdown, you know, having to figure out the school, the whole, and she had COVID, right? And I, was, like, talk about getting pushed past, past a breaking point. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there've been all these pluses, but wow, again, we're, we're seeing that the safety net, our parents, um, and oftentimes single parents and right. And, and that's not a safety net that's necessarily sustainable. Um, and wondering if either of you have done anything because this is one, I don't think anyone has really figured out yet, right. In terms of childcare. Yeah. This one's hard because you can't just bring in childcare, right. Um, because of. COVID, <laughs> right. you, can't, um, you know, we've certainly uh, worked on flexing hours and letting people block time if they need to work with their kids on schoolwork. It, it is really tough. Um, there are some resources out there that you can push out where there's, if they're not getting what they need from the school systems where there's learning uh, that you can kind of push out. But this is a very, this is a very difficult one. Usually we would just send help. You can't really send help right now. This yeah, you can, you can give more flexibility though. And we absolutely have the ability to do that. We need to do that. Yeah, for us, this, was, this is a moment too that really highlights how I think um, to address d &I problems, you need to think through the foundations of your HR strategy with the d &I lens. And so what I, what was made so acutely aware to me through this time, it's how incredibly um, important and critical our manager population was to those people who were struggling, you know, as working parents or as people living alone and struggling with their mental health, we needed to enable our managers to be able to think through how they could support flexible work, how they could provide that emotional support to the man, to the individuals on their teams. Because we knew, you know, we got the question a lot, how do you handle performance management for someone who just is not capable of working in hours of the day? And the truth is there's no one size fits all answer to that. We still need, you know, everybody's got their objectives. We still need to be able to, you know, keep the, the business going. And so it really is um, critical that the manager is working with each individual person on their team to find the circumstance that works best for the both the individual's personal circumstance and their work responsibilities. And so we have spent a lot of time sort of pouring our energy into equipping the managers um, because a lot of managers sort of, when they don't know, will fall back on rules. And the rules are that you should be online and available from nine to five every day. And the rules are that you should be, you know, sort of completing eight hours worth of work every day. And we really needed to help break, um, you know, certainly not all of our managers, but we had to break that kind of expectation uh, in order to facilitate that flexibility. Yeah, I think there's um, th there's this hire for retention piece that needs to kick in right now. That is, there are, and it just happens that everybody's going through these big things together, but what really is essential to keep the business running? What do, you know, what are those um, milestones and benchmarks that people have to hit? And, and do you care when that work happens and how can you be flexible? Um, and I, I think that there are going to be a lot of best practices that come out of this in terms of what is possible um, and how people can deliver work. I think the other thing that's been really interesting is, I, is seeing much more vulnerability. Um, you know, and, and I, I love that, you know, people saying, you know, yeah, no, I've, 
I was on a call um, last week with a woman whose baby woke up from a nap and, you know, baby came in and I was psyched because I got to see baby and, but, but before that would have been unheard of. Um, you know, I think that there was a lot in early days where people weren't even understanding sort of like the background and, and understanding that people might be living in a, a studio apartment with multiple, you know, so they were, that's where the class things came in. So it, like, let's make sure that people can have backgrounds and aren't feeling any shame about their financial situation and lots of little small things that again, there's no silver bullet. Um, this is all a number of, of little things. Um, I want to I want to run a poll and just um, hear from all of you, um, you know what you think um, the the experience with work from home has been, whether it's been more negative, more positive. Um, so Ben, if you would pull that poll up. Perfect. So would you say that work from home has had a positive or negative impact on inclusion and belonging in your organization? Positive, negative, or mixed bag? Um, for those employees in non-essential roles, will your organization stay uh, work from home after the pandemic? Um, yes, we're going to stay. No, we're going back to on-site or hybrid. Um, we'll be both remote and on-site. And and Steph and Becca, I'd love for you all uh, to answer these questions as we're as we've got the poll open. For us, we're going to do a hybrid model, um, and I think and, and I'm excited to do that. We've had uh, interestingly, we're having a lot of people call us and ask to come back, even though we can't open our offices. Um, the mental health piece is tough. We have so many, so many young singletons who are not living anywhere near family and stuff like that. So they're, they're eager to come back. Um, but we are going to do a hybrid. Great. I'm just watching the poll results. I'm fascinated by how many are going hybrid. Uh, yeah. as of now, I would say that our, our company is not, um, I, we are still uh, having discussions, I think, but as of now, our plan is to return on site. Um, but I'm so curious to kind of see how the talent market evolves. Um, uh, and, you know, we want to be sure we're adapting to that. Um, but, but yeah, generally speaking, we're planning to go back to the office. And I, I would say, um, yeah, 80% of you saying that it's going to be a hybrid model. Um, and um, only 5% saying we're going to stay remote, which is, which is interesting. Um, and only 15% saying, you know, we're going fully back on site. And I'm not surprised by the work from home being sort of this mixed bag, right? Two thirds saying we've seen the positive, we've seen the negative, a little more on the positive side than negative. Um, and I think of all of this, we wanna remember like how, um, how to take the good um, and how to take these little learnings and build them into systems and process. Uh, because right, it'll be easy to sort of go back and forget um, if, if there's not some, boy, here's what we learned, even a debrief and ongoing debriefs about, you know, what should we start doing based on this? What should we stop doing based on this? And what should we continue doing? Um, because I think that reflection piece is really, really key. All right. So I don't, um, you know, there were different events this past year where my phone was blowing up, my email was blowing up, and it was, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? We were, you know, that was friends, family, clients, everybody, this, this energy of, um, I, I have to do something. And how did you all leverage that into something that was, again, meaningful, sustainable, and not performative. Yeah, I think that um, we certainly wanted to make sure that anything we did was was real, right? Um, and I think that so many organizations, I think a lot of it came from really good, real heart space. And then when it landed, it landed badly. So you have to be careful of that. But I would say do something, don't not do something for fear of doing <laughs> the wrong thing, like do something. Um, the things that we added to what we were doing, we, we obviously wanted to do a very a nice big donation out of the gate because we can. We're still profitable, we're still active and, and we're able to do that. And it was exciting. We did a donation that was, I think, 30 times bigger than anything we'd ever done. And that was, you know, that is something that was exciting for our people because people were feeling, usually we would gather them together and we would 
go actively do things together and maybe volunteer and organize things. And you can't do that because we're in a pandemic. <laughs> so there's all this really amazing energy to move things forward and yet everyone has to stay at home. So we did some things like that. Um, we had been working on um, launching the Everyday Inclusion app, which was quite timely when you think about it, because everyone can go through this at their own pace in a safe space, go through their training uh, on an app, on their phone. We work in mobile, so that's a great place for things. And while well, we had um, certainly interest in it before, people were really excited to engage in it in that moment. Uh, we pushed out um, a DNI learning path through LinkedIn. Um, it's something that had existed before, but we did a big push for it. We put up an anti-racism resource page for people. And then we put a bunch of money into some, um, some training. And, and, and the two, we did a number of things, but two things I think are interesting and that people might want to consider. We did some small group work with a wonderful, uh, wonderful leader so that people could talk about what was going on for them in this moment. And when you're dealing with um, things that are so sensitive and so intimate, having a big 500 people on a call is, is, in my opinion, not necessarily how to go. You, at an all hands, you can tell people what you're going to do. But I think that if people are going to have real conversation, it needs to be small. And usually that would happen in an office and it couldn't. Um, so we created these small places where people could come together and talk about their experiences and what they were feeling um, in, a, in a very safe place. And then we followed that up with um, some trainings on building empathy to increase a comfort with uh, diversity and inclusion, not just in our office space, but just in the world. Um, so I think it gave them all these safe, good resources they could actively participate in and a sense of pride that they're that their company was was donating and participating and actively putting things out there. I wanna, there's a question in the Q&A that I think is worth, worth uh, addressing now, which is what app do you use? Because Stephanie, you had mentioned the Everyday Inclusion app. Uh, so at the risk of embarrassing you, Mo, I think it's, it's worth just mentioning it. The Everyday Inclusion app is on, actually maybe Mo, you can describe where you can access it, but it's, at the, it's a Moxie exchange platform. Yeah, and it's great, and we're so happy to have it. It's just such, it's an easy, safe resource for people. And I think one of the things that I know that both of you did that I think is really important, like let's let's state the obvious here. We're three white women. Um, and the conversations that needed to be had around race in no way, shape, or form should have been be led by um, three white women. And I know that y'all did some some really great work in terms of of that, Becca. Like, um, you know, I got to participate in a yeah. in a in a town hall, yeah. but we we brought in Trudy Bourgeois, right? Who's right? So okay. she and and as she said, there are things that I can say that you should never say, and things that you can say that I can't say. And and we very you were very um, we were really thoughtful about that conversation and how that conversation was structured. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't say it better. I think um, I think we had are, been poised to launch DNI training right before uh, COVID hit, and we had to sort of pause spending because we were trying to figure out what our, was, was going to be the financial impact. Um, and when the um, George Floyd was murdered, and there was a major social justice movement in the country. It was a moment where we were able to quickly unlock the budget and launch the training that we had already planned. Um, but it was clear we needed to hear from, from important voices that hadn't been given space um, or that just we hadn't deliberately considered, um, uh, which is, you know, embarrassing to say. Um, and so we, we, you know, with through your introduction, Mo, we brought Trudy Bourgeois in and she, um, gave a, an incredibly powerful town hall where she was able to talk about her experiences of black women in corporate America and gave voice to some perspectives that that we needed in that moment. Um, and the, I mean, I, I, I think something like 95% of the company dialed in for that. Um, and it was just, it was, it was a moment that really um, 
uh, matter to people. And we have since then followed it up with several other speakers who have come in and been able to provide their own perspectives. Um, so a speaker series is something that, and it's happened a little bit organically. We haven't even had to sort of plan it out. It's just that we've identified new people to come in um, and it's it's been really powerful. Uh, so in addition to the unconscious bias training, um, just not only having these speaker series, but then bringing together people for, um, we, we call them, office hours, um, you know, and they, we talk and, uh, you know, really candidly, people ask questions and we bring in experts and so that we can just sort of process and, and ask um, and respond to the things we're learning. Yeah, I think that's, I think the other thing that, that y'all did um, is you were, you launched Uplift. Um, so if you want to share a little bit yeah, about that. Sure. Yeah. Uplift is our, um, so we, we had just, we had launched Uplift, I think back in the spring, and it is an ERG specifically for allies. Um, so these are specifically for people who are interested in um, uh, improving and kind of pushing the, the thinking on unconscious bias and on inclusion. Um, and anybody can join who wants to engage in that dialogue. Uh, it's, I think it, it may be next to our Superwomen ERG, which is our oldest ERG. It's been around for five or six years now. Um, Uplift is, has the largest employee population. Um, and uh, it's just, we've just got great movement there. So that's been a really important place to bring together people who are passionate about being allies and advocates um, and giving them um, an opportunity to, um, you know, not only practice the skills that they're learning, but also um, think through the, the actions that they can take um, to improve the company. And I think the the way you launched that was really great too. There was a charter, there was a vision, there was it right. There was there were the goals. There were the, it wasn't just sort of the it's going to be this feel good thing. Here here was our purpose, and here's what we're doing, and here's our executive sponsor. Really, really well launched. Yeah. And um, speaking of of the executive sponsor, and let's let's now talk about how you engaged your executive teams who were already. You weren't, you weren't cold start. Um, you already had executive leadership teams that were you know, engaged and involved. How did you really then anchor this in to your strategy and sort of the cultural DNA? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. We, I would say that, and my executive team has changed a little bit since, since all this kind of broke loose. Um, but, you know, I have had and, and have an amazing, uh, wonderful CEO, and I had a different wonderful CEO right before this. Um, and I think one of the things that was really most amazing about uh, my formal CEO and, and, and the current one is being white males and me being white female, um, they really understood that what we were going to have to do is put resources out there and step back a little bit and let some other people take the lead. That may be one of the hardest things, you know, for, for people out there who have passion around this stuff, it may be one of the hardest things that you will do. Um, I've lived in this world for 30 years. I feel like I'm a great expert and sometimes the most important thing you can do is give other people the floor and it's hard. Um, so I think that I had great, uh, you know, I had an executive team that understood that we have a we have a very white executive team. I think I can just I gotta put it out there, um, and and we knew that, um, and we're aware of that, and so there was great openness in in bringing other people in to be experts. So I think that that's wonderful, and also that they said, great, we'll reroute funds. You need money for to bring people in to do this work. Great, you need time uh, and space for people to be involved. Great. So I think that they wanted to be all in and also you know, wanted to be in a supportive role. And, and that's going to be different for a lot of executives who are used to being in a leading role. Um, and so I think that's that's a, an important thing. I think there are three, uh, something that you brought up there that's really important is people, process, and profit. Um, those are sort of your three gates. And are you, are you giving resources, people, process, and profit? So yeah, great. Becca? Yeah, we... Um... Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I think our leadership team was already um, invested in, in diversity in particular, but hadn't necessarily spent a lot of time considering the, the programmatic elements of building an inclusive culture. Um, and so as a part of this sort of DNI strategy that we had begun to build with you, um, Mo, we brought the, lead, the leads together. So the CEO and his direct reports 
for um, three hours over two days of um, just an inclusion training um, and a dialogue about how we are gonna do this again, kind of programmatically as leaders. Uh, this is a team that uh, values their time more than almost anything else. And so the fact that they were willing to invest this is I, I haven't gotten them to do a training this long on any other topic, uh, but they, they recognize it as, as deeply um, important. And again, when you think back to how powerful diverse voices on our leadership team has been to the success of our business, it wasn't hard to make the case of how important this is to, to um, make it work across the company and, and you know all the way through their teams. Uh, so they were on board. And I think what, one of the things that both of you did is you, you didn't let um, you didn't let either one of your organizations go straight to, we're going to hire X percent more of. Um, you really were looking at measures of inclusion. You were looking at how do we, you know, everything from recruit, develop, promote, retrain, retain all the way through. How do you interrupt that systemic bias? And then how do you create cultures of inclusion? And I think that is, so, you know, you didn't go that knee jerk route. Well, well that you, you hit something that is such a, a passion point of mine, which is that I don't know that there is any business challenge more complex or more unique than behavior change. And it is not the type of thing that you can solve with a traditional business plan. You can't set metrics, build an action plan, and then execute, like, you know, just to get it done. Yep. It's not, you know four or five major initiatives executed by a few people. It is small behavior changes that everybody commits to making. And so that, you know, there is an always, and I've been dealing with this for, you know, my entire career with really well-intentioned leaders who want to set a metric, track it and move, you know, really hard towards Check it. that box. That's right, that's right. But it creates these really strange incentives that actually can be um, sort of deeply um, uh, problematic. You know, problematic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I, I was so um, happy to, you know, again, have a receptive leadership team too that understood that if you set these metrics, you drive the wrong behavior. Let's focus on driving the right behaviors. Yeah, yeah. I want to run a quick poll because I'm looking at the time and we have just a couple um, couple of minutes. So Ben, if you would pull up our um, second to last poll here, it's really asking um, in the past three months, have you had the overall sort of employee experience? And I, I wanted this to be from the last three months, right? Because there was a lot of enthusiasm. Um, are you seeing that be uh, consistent? Um, are people still engaged? Same thing um, with the leadership team is the enthusiasm for doing this work because this is a journey. Um, there is no end destination. Um, and, I, and I'm curious, right? Because we knew there was going to be a spike. Um, now let's talk about sustainability. And, and everything that y'all have been sharing has been about sustainability um, and really weaving this. We talk about this is woven into every single thing that you do as an organization. Um, I'm going to keep the poll open just for another five seconds here. These results are really fascinating. Um, let me share these results. So really very split. Um, although what I appreciate seeing is the employees are, are staying with you. Right, there's about 75% that it's either increasing or it's staying the same, that level of enthusiasm. Um, and about the same, uh, and, and even a little better with uh, leadership team. And I, I will tell you, that gives me hope. That gives me hope that, again, I, I've, yeah, you know, having done this work for a long time, for the first time I'm seeing um, particularly white women be willing to give up some privilege and stay on this journey. Um, I wanna wrap this up here because one of the things that you all did was really taking a multimodal approach. You didn't say it's gonna be one training, it's gonna be this system or it's gonna be, um, so talk to me about that. You know, you've talked a little bit about some of the programs, how you've, how you've delivered them, how you've built into systems, you know, in just a minute or two that we have left because we've got great questions that are, um, 
that are rolling in here. Um, let's hear Steph um, from you, just sort of a quick hit on this. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to approach it from a lot of ways because it's not gonna, because you're doing behavior change, right? I think what Becca said was incredibly important. Um, and for all of these tools that you put out, whatever you're putting out, another thing Becca said that I thought was was great is her leadership participated. So if your executives are showing up and they are doing the trainings, they are showing up for the speakers and stuff, then it's gonna embed better because they need to model it. So absolutely, we look at it a lot of ways. There's the in person that are now not in person trainings um, there. It starts with your recruiting process. It starts with your and then it moves to your onboarding process. Incredibly important. Your review process. All those things have to be built in so that it's always top of mind. It needs to be built into your values. It has to be very clearly built into your values and you need to use them as a filter for every decision you make. Um, and so that that's where I think you'd have to have this foundation. And so we certainly have it in trainings, we have it in onboarding, we have it in our uh, talent acquisition process. And then having the access again, some of the tools we mentioned that we do use the app and that's been incredibly effective for us to, to touch people uh, kind of an ongoing basis. And then doing an ongoing speaker series or things like that will keep energy up and excitement up. Um, because you do want to make it engaging for people. Yeah, yeah, great. Becca? Yeah, I think um, I, I would plus one everything Stephanie said where we are trying to do exactly those things as well. Um, one, you know, having worked at um, companies that have done pushes on you know, trainings, right? Like everybody goes through a training or everybody goes through a training once a year. We're trying, uh, we're trying something a little bit different, which is that we're trying to just um, make it a, constant steady drumbeat. And so one of the, the, the way we are doing unconscious bias training is through these micro learnings, uh, which are on most Mox Exchange um, platform, which is just two or three minutes, which again, you can watch it on your phone, you can watch it on your computer, two or three minute lessons every day or once a week, rather than sort of this three hour in-person training. We do do in-person training for our managers uh, and we do bring up unconscious bias training in our onboarding. Um, but generally speaking, we're just trying to make it a part of the day-to-day -day language. Uh, and that's really important. Yeah, well, and I, yeah, I mean, there, there are things that, you know, in all the, the neuroscience around this too, right? Like we're trying to protect the oxygen in our brain um, and so that's why, you know, anything that you can do that's habit, that's nudge, that's little, that's small, but grounded, right? So thinking about all of this is sort of building a, building scaffolding um, around your approach from those, the daily nudges all the way through what are our systems and policies. Um, I want to run one last quick poll and then go to Q&A because, wow, y'all are, are throwing us some great questions. Um, Ben, if you would pull up that last poll. Um, it, it's interesting to me, we've seen a lot more um, people willing to, to go toward technology where before they, they weren't, because um, they thought, oh, we can't do that. And now, now we're seeing all these, the tech. So how have, and you can um, pull out all of the, everything that applies here, you know, what are the tools in your toolkit? Um, uh, how have you delivered those tools, knowledge, programs, resources? Has it been the live instructor training um, through ERGs, through tech-based programs and tools such as mobile apps, your intranet subscription to um, external knowledge platforms, conferences, events, other, um, we're seeing those come in and then um, work from home shattered ideas about um, what employees are open to and can accomplish using tech. Do you think your organization is more likely to take a multimodal approach and utilize additional DEI resources, tools uh, in the coming year? We're gonna keep this open just for another minute here. Not another minute, we don't have another minute, another five seconds. Um, boy, the, your results are still coming in, but I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share these results because I think they're really interesting. So a lot of you, right, a third of you have done uh, instructor-led training, but then lots of things around, you know, ERGs, a little bit of tech, not much, um, intranet, conferences and events. Um, I actually saw a stat, there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of budget spent on conferences and events um, and the work from home um, made you much more likely uh, to jump in on some of these um, tech resources. So let me 
do this before we jump into um, uh, the Q and A. It's all. This is all about action. We talked about right this being about sustained action. So think about what's one idea you're going to implement that you've heard today, um, and one action that you're going to take. Um, and I'd love to see you um, throw some of those um, in the chat and. Um, uh, so that we can all hold each other accountable for moving forward. Um, and now let's um, uh, now let's go to some of these questions. Um, ooh, <laughs> y'all, where do you want to jump in? Well, I there are we... a couple questions about the the comment I made about metrics that I'm. Um, eager to respond to because I, I love yes. it. Yes. Yes. Jump um, in. Yeah. And I want to, there were two that, um, uh, well, so let me sort of mention a couple of things. First, I, we, we absolutely measure um, progress across a, a variety of things. So we do track diversity hiring and we do track um, participation in trainings. And so we can report out on those, which is very, um, appreciated by the leadership who value metrics. Uh, and so there's a difference to, to me in tracking versus using a goal to, to drive a strategy. And so I see tracking as sort of the thing we do after uh, we implement rather than kind of setting something up for front. The second thing, and this is an idea and, you know, it's, it's one way we're trying. To me, the the metric that I aspire to most and that I believe is the best way we can measure success is when we take, when our employees take our employee engagement survey, which we do every year, and there are, you know, tons of platforms. We use Culture Amp, um, but, you know, uh, there are plenty of different companies use different ones. And the questions are, if I were offered a job with similar pay and benefits, I would not leave Upstart, those types of questions. To me, if we can cut those results by the different demographics, the different intersectionalities and see similar responses for white men, black women, you know, um, uh, all types. That's yep. when we know we've done a good job yep. uh, with our inclusion strategy. What we yep. are seeing, and we, you know, I've seen this at every company is that those results right now are not at parity. Um, right. you know, men think that we're in a much more inclus inclusive environment uh, than, than black women do. And you, and you absolutely have to slice and dice that data. You know, that we built a pull survey into the app that are, they're about, I feel like I'm included and I belong on my team in this organization, right? Because inclusion and belonging are so emotional. And I think that's really important that you can't just do, here's, here's our overall organizational, you know, I, I, we worked with an organization that you know, they had these incredible numbers and it's like, well, yeah, this place is a frat. If you're a white male, everything feels great. Right. But, but when they, and then when they did the slice and dice, they were like, we have some serious issues. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, what, what else from these questions? I don't know if y'all want to grab one. That you think is in here. Right. I, think that I saw a couple um, questions about, you know, is the app free? Can I get free stuff? I, I would, I would say this, if you're paying for other things in your organization, put the same value on building out diversity. Um, and I know that budgets are tight, but honestly, this is a place where we shouldn't be afraid to write a check because it supports something important. Um, so if you can, I would encourage that you make it a priority in your budget. And I, what I've always said is, you know, when you're looking at things, it just from a business standpoint, if there's not a budget line, how much do you value it? So I would, I would encourage you to, to, to fight for that a little bit. Yeah, I think, again, people process and profit. Um, and, and what can you do to encourage um, the DEI to be a part of your overall strategy? Um, something that, you know, looking at measurement, uh, Becca, one of the things is really having some accountability built in um, at the manager and above level around, you know, what do things look like on their teams, right? with a very, very clear, not even a dotted line, right? A deep, bold line um, to business results, right? Understanding that those are connected. So a leader should be measured against that. Um, you know, we mentioned, um, there are some other things like, you know, around questions about um, conversations around race and small team stuff. 
Um, I highly recommend Trudy Bourgeois. I think she's just phenomenal for that. Um, yeah, like, I've also got a couple of Shola K is excellent. Um, and she's somebody that I, we used before all this can happen. She's someone who does a lot of different trainings, um, but is a, an amazing, um, amazing person for that kind of work as well. We've, we've been asked a couple of questions in here um, around, you know, for a small nonprofit or I haven't been able to get people there yet from a budget standpoint, um, you know, what are some resources? I think you're on one right now. Um, I think the, the, the webinars um, and, and things that the forum put out are phenomenal. Um, we actually run on our, uh, on my LinkedIn profile we have a weekly everyday inclusion and belonging series um, where we're interviewing people uh, on everything, um, on, on gender identity and disability and race and best practices. And you know that's free and they're, they're out on the feed. We actually also have those um, on our um, website in the blog section um, that have the transcriptions as well. So um, there are some things if you have um, LinkedIn programs um, that are out there that if you've got, you know, premiums, if you have a LinkedIn premium, um, what are some of the other free resources and tools that you all have? You know, we do. Um, we certainly pay for a lot, but I would say that the series that you've got on LinkedIn is excellent and you can set that up for your people or you're kind of feeding it to them um, and that would provide something as good as anything you pay for, quite frankly. Um, and then building a resource page is something that might be a great thing. So we built an anti-racism resource page um, and that is something that you can do easily and, and for no money because there are incredible resources out there. And I would, I, I wanna chime in on that um, because one of the, I think one of failure is too strong a word. I think one of the things that has happened over this last year um, is we have missed intersectionality in, so there's been a lot of focus on race and rightly so. Um, and when you look at some of these issues, it's, you know, race plus disability, race plus mental health, mm -hmm. race plus class, right? So as you're building out those pages, make those resources intersectional. Um, don't just focus on, it, it's a little bit like, you know, programs that were like, we're going to have um, programs for women. And those programs ha heavily benefited white women at the expense uh, of women of color, right? So we don't want to make that mistake again now. Really make sure you've got a, a really robust um, a set of resources there. Um, and somebody just asked, how can you get the app? Um, we're actually giving it to you for free for two weeks. <laughs> Um, so you can go um, to the website, themoxieexchange.com slash event dash attendee dash trial. Two weeks, have at it, go play, get those inclusion nudges. Um, and and we, we really value that people spent the time to do this. You're, you're showing a commitment to DEI by being here. So there's a treat for you. I had a hard question that I'll answer because I always think you should answer the uncomfortable ones. Um, someone asked, what are you doing, Stephanie, to increase your uh, diversity in your leadership? Because I mentioned it was pretty yeah. white leadership. Um, and, that, and it's a good question. Uh, and when you have an established leadership team that's there and nobody's going anywhere, it's an it's a even harder question. So our leadership team is predominantly white. It's 20% um, people of color, or that would be person of color in this, this state, and 40% um, and women. And what we've done um, to try to expand that is we're building a layer called the senior leadership that's right under executive um, to add people to that group that will be the succession plan. Um, and obviously if we have openings, that's we're gonna look there too. But until there are openings, uh, we felt like we needed to do something faster. And so building in that senior leadership team and two people that we've added so far, a person of color and um, a woman. Uh, so we are trying to build it. Is it as fast and as good as it should be? Nope, um, but it is a place where you can look is, are you building a succession plan where you're building in people to move into those roles? Or are you opening up your leadership teams um, to have people that maybe don't have a certain title in them so that they have the influence? It's a place to start, it's not the end, yeah. And I would say, I would add to that, make sure that, because um, again, none of this is overnight. Um, you didn't get here 
overnight. You won't um, change overnight. Really thinking about this both from top down and bottom up, right? Mm -hmm. Diversity and equity, those are leadership and systems. Inclusion and belonging, it's all employees all day long. And those, those behaviors all day long make sure you also have um, that folks from underrepresented groups are getting sponsored in your organizations. Sponsorship is so, so critical. So, you know, when you're, when you're getting ready to, um, you know, promote those people have been sponsored and there is an advocate in the room. Yeah, that is a really great point because we do a much better job in our general population than our leadership. Um, and that is, uh, so hopefully that plays out in the right way, but can't be hopeful in it. You actually have to be active in it. I know we're at time. We one of the things we've struggled with with sponsorship is, you know, how do you get exposure to people? Sponsorship can't be inorganic. You can, or I'm sorry, yeah, you can't, you know, just pick a person and sponsor them. So we use our ERGs, people who have raised their hands to say they want leadership positions in ERGs, and those are the people that we give exposure to, so that we can, you know, identify them as as leaders um, and sponsor them for for larger positions within their own sort of career track. I feel like we could talk forever and I know that we're at time. Um, ben, I don't know if you want to wrap us up here or- um, I was gonna know, say, you, I, still I know, have, um, uh, you, you still have four minutes if you want to take one more question. I mean, we can wrap oh, it up, but we still, oh. have, we, still, we still have a few minutes if you want to take some uh, one last question. Yeah, well, I think there's been a theme of questions around um, how do you make sure this isn't performative? or isn't just lip service. Um, and, and I think there are a couple of things in there, right? Where you, you measure what matters, right? So making sure that there's measurement, that there is budget, that you can, um, I would say here in the West, we say um, big hat, no cattle. Um, for those people that are all talk, no action. Um, so making sure that it is, um, you know, a little hat and, and lots of cattle, right? That you are, you show by actions, right? You show by, you know, we're setting up an ERG. We are giving people access to different tools and resources. We are able to talk about how we're driving um, systemic bias out of our people management practices. And it is really about showing up again and again and again, and always asking the question, we'd say uh, inclusion, uh, curiosity is an inclusion superpower. Um, so always asking the question, who's not in the room? Who should be involved in this uh, situation? What's the bias here, right? And continuing to ask those questions that really get to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And, and Steph and Becca, I'd love um, for you to jump in on that as well. I'll let Becca go first, because I've been jumping in a lot. No, you go ahead, Stephanie. I need, I need, I like it when you go first because it gives me a minute to think. It's big. It's a big topic. I mean, I think as we're kind of looking at how we, it, it's so big, um, all of it. I think that as we kind of look at where we're going to get this, um, where we're going to get traction, right? Um, it's going to be complex. It's going to be hard, and it's going to come from all all of our our different levels. And I, I was looking also at kind of people asking how do these other voices get into the room? You know, like we could get stuck right here where we're talking and we're performative and we're like, we've done our donations and we've updated our websites, but there's gonna be this huge behavioral change and that's gonna be hard and it's gonna mean that you're gonna need to bring people in the room, even when sometimes it doesn't feel organic. Um, and and that's, I think, where, where a lot of us might get stuck and you're gonna have to fight through that space. Um, and um, yeah, it's such a it's such a complex and messy thing that I think some people will get to a place where they want to turn away from it because it becomes uncomfortable. Oh, that is so, this is messy. This is messy and it's hard. And if it's not messy and it's hard, you're actually not getting there. I think that is like any sort of growth. Um, I'm not a diver, but the like, people that dive, the part of the reef that thrives the most is the one that's getting hit by the waves. Um, and it's, it is the same thing with organizations like, yeah, it, I, it's messy and it's hard and we're going to, we're going to learn and grow through that. I think that is such an important point because otherwise we stay very polite and, um, we don't get to the, you know, people are so afraid of making mistakes or staying or doing the wrong thing. You're going to, 
Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it's scary. That's the, I think that's important. It can be really scary to step out there and, and try to do something. Um, and deeply humbling, right? Yeah, get ready to be humbled. Yeah. <laughs> and that's uncomfortable. You know? and, it's, and it's so worth it because if... If I'm was whatever my privilege might be in that situation, my ability to get uncomfortable means that somebody else can feel like they're included and belong. Right. Yeah. The, the worst thing to do is be be worried about making a mistake or saying or doing something, and then somebody sits out there othered and marginalized. Um, so and honestly, for some of us to be uncomfortable is that the worst thing that's happening in the world? No, 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 <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> like. It might exactly. suck, but honestly, compared to compared to what you know, people are going through when they are marginalized, where they have to softly step through the world. Yeah, it's you'll be fine. You'll be fine. It may not be fun every day, but you'll be fine. And it's the good, important work to do. I just saw something that says that the trial link isn't working. Um, we will absolutely make sure that that is up and working. Um, we tested it, but we'll test it again. And I promise you, give us five minutes after this and we'll have it working for you. Hey Mo, there's a lot of people asking for some resource and stuff. And I was flipping through that in the Q and A. Um, if there's a way that we can, outside of this, respond to things, I'd you know, be happy. People who've asked for resources or names of people, I'd love to be able to respond to people because there's so many questions. Yeah, well, and Ben, I don't know if you- Oh, sorry, I was gonna say on that note, would you like to share the best way for people to contact you to follow up to get more resources? Um, uh, like obviously you can visit yeah, the Moxie what, Exchange what, website. Yep. Yeah. And, and if you want to send, um, you can send, I'll, I will protect Steph and Becca's inboxes. <laughs> um, if you want to send, <laughs> uh, it's Maureen, M-A-U-R-E-E-N at Moxie, M-O-X-I-E exchange. So there's two E's in there. Maureen at moxieexchange.com. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to sort of funnel resources your way. Um, you know, some that Steph and Becca have both mentioned um, and a lot that we've got at Moxie as well. Yeah, I'm happy to share anything. That's another thing is if you've got good stuff and you're willing to share it with your greater universe, um, get Sherry right now, because this is a good time for us to all, you yep. know, if we work to research something or put something together, share it with people. Yeah, I think the other thing is I'm happy to, I'm um, again, our LinkedIn series, um, and my profile hit me up and, and I can also you know, curate um, content there as well. Great, thank you so much. Like they always say, sharing is caring. Um, <laughs> I <was> a, <laughs> wanna thank all three of you for being here and for this wonderful webinar um, and this just great conversation. And for everyone who participated today, um, like keep, uh, there were so many great questions that we weren't able to answer. So there may be a follow-up podcast. Stay tuned um, for that information. But as pro promised, um, the these both were HRCI and SHRM eligible. Uh, so the HRCI activity ID is 548102. And the SHRM activity, activity ID is 21-R3N as in November, A as in Apple, M as in Mary. And both those were posted in the chat and this will, and they'll be included in a follow-up email that you'll be receiving shortly. But um, yeah, so yeah, as Maureen said, if you want to continue the, e the conversation, feel, please feel free to email her or visit the moxieexchange.com to get that free two week access to the app. Uh, join us in April for our, our um, next well, we're taking a little hiatus because we have our, our annual conference coming up in March. So join us in April for our next webinar, Bystander to from Bystander to Ally, with presenters Tatiana Fertermeister of Connecting Differences and Dr. Daniel Yalowitz of DCY Consulting on Thursday, April 15th, 2021 at 11 a.m. Central Standard Times. New episodes of the Forum podcast are available now. Um, you can visit our website form workplace inclusion board class podcast to listen podcast is also available on apple podcast spotify stitcher and anchor thank you then so much for joining us and we hope to have you join us for future webinars and thank you again to our presenters have a great day have a happy new year everyone bye <laughs>